Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. All right. Uh, so, would like to request uh, someone to lead us in prayer, and then we'll get into today's lesson. Shall I pray? Yes, yes, Abhi. Please do. Thank you, Father God Almighty. We just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the new morning that has come because of your grace and mercy, Father. You lead us, Father. Lord, you are beautiful, you are merciful, you are graceful, you are slow to anger, Father, rich in mercy, rich in your grace, rich in your words, Lord, Father. What you say you do, Father. We look up to you, Father, for every need that we have. And this morning, we need that wisdom to understand your plans and purposes, Father, as we are learning about the church, Father. Father, open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirit to receive every word in its fullness, Father. Be rooted in it, Father. Be able to be guided by it, Father. Bless our teacher, Father. Bless her with double portion anointing this morning, strength and wisdom, your favor, and continue to lead her, Father, as she leads us, Father. Fill us all with the power of your Holy Spirit, Father, and help us to walk as your kingdom ambassadors, Father, to spread the kingdom and, and Lord Father, strengthen the local church, Father. We once again thank you for everything that you've done in our lives beyond measure, Lord Father, what we can't even think or imagine. You're working behind and you're working to make our lives fruitful, Father. We thank you that you are with us and you said that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. We believe and we receive, Lord Father, your grace and mercy this morning to go through the day and, Father, be uh, with us throughout the day. Bless us and keep us. In the matchless name of Jesus, our Savior, we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So uh, let's uh, continue. Uh, in the last uh, class, I think we have touched on two um, uh, pictures of the church, the vine um, and uh, Zion, the church being Zion. So the last picture here, uh, which is the 10th one, is that of the lampstand. So we will look at that and then we will proceed uh, you know, and uh, go on to other subjects uh, that concern the local church. So the 10 pictures which we needed to look at, we've already looked at nine of them. Uh, we're looking at the 10th one now. So when we see, um, uh, when we Consider the lampstand. Now, God uh, instructed Moses to construct a tabernacle, which is really the picture of the worship of heaven. So, the worship of heaven, um, uh, you know, you, the essence of it was uh, uh, was sort of uh, couldn't say captured, but uh, God asked. Moses to shadow that in the earthly tabernacle. So he constructed the tabernacle. He had you know different parts of the tabernacle, and one of the uh, uh, one of the items that was kept in the holy place is the menorah. Menorah, or uh, you could you call it the golden lampstand. Um, you know, if you've seen a picture of that, it it is uh, generally. The original one is beaten out of one piece of metal, and then it, you know it has these uh, seven um, uh, portions where you light the lamp, and that provides you know the lamp uh, that provides the light in the holy place. Now this lamp stand, you know, it has uh, some significance. So we will we will try and uh, understand what it means. So it has seven candlesticks. Okay, so seven candlesticks in the uh, lampstand. When we uh, look at certain scriptures, uh, particularly in Revelation, uh, we see that the Lord Jesus is walking among the lampstands. Okay, so we will read that passage and then we'll try to um, uh, understand what it means. This is from Revelation chapter one, verses 12, 13, and then verse 20. In our notes, this is on page number um, one one five. So, can somebody please read it? Revelation one, verses twelve, thirteen, and twenty. Shall I read, ma'am? Yes, yes, Abhi. Revelation chapter one, verses twelve. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, 
and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of seven church of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Avni. And as we see in this passage, scripture interprets itself. So there is this uh, um, introduction about a lampstand and later on you know, John writes that these lampstands represent the seven churches and we know that you know, uh, John addresses each church and the, uh, the positives of the church as well as uh, you know he points out certain things that God is warning them about. So the seven lampstands actually represent the seven churches. So we've understood that. Now again, you know, when we look at uh, uh, Revelation 2, similarly, we, we, we can uh, see that the lampstand means a church. Okay, And also in the first passage we saw, there is a reference to the stars uh, of the churches. That of, that there is a reference to the stars. There is a reference to the angels. The angels of the churches, obviously we know that God really doesn't assign an angel one angel per church so uh, we don't we don't have any other uh, uh, passage that reveals this uh, and therefore we conclude that that word angel uh, really means messenger so that should mean the pastor of the church okay it is just messenger so um we we will not interpret that as a heavenly messenger but every church has an angel or a messenger which would be the pastor of that church so the lampstands are the churches and the angels or the stars are the pastors or the overseers of those churches so we see that uh, in heaven, uh, God, the, the Lord Jesus is walking among the lampstands. So the lampstands have a representation up in heaven. Okay? They have a representation up in heaven. So in other words, we could say that um, every local church, every local church on the earth, uh, it is like a lampstand in heaven. And when we talk about the Lord Jesus walking among the lampstands, basically it means that he is looking, observing, he is um, uh, well aware of every local church that exists here on the earth. Okay, so that is our understanding. And, you know, uh, we, we also see the way John wrote to uh, the churches, you know, warning them uh, and asking them in the areas where they were lacking. He, in fact, said that they must repent. So I think it is worthwhile to also read the next passage given in our notes here, which is Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 and 5. So it follows uh, what Avni read just now. So this is um, on top of page 116. I'd like to request one other person to please read this passage, Revelation 2, verses 1 and 5, please. Revelations 2, 1 and 5. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Sam. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Okay, thank you. Thank you, son. So there's a warning, a warning to the messenger or the overseer of every lampstand. In other words, every local church. This is what uh, God says. This is what Jesus says. He says that we need to repent. Unless we repent, um, 
our lampstand will not continue in god's presence so i'm just going to read that verse 5 again revelation 2 verse 5 remember therefore from where you have fallen repent and do the first work so this is in the context of the ephesian church so uh, the john is addressing the seven churches of asia minor you know at that time those were some of the prominent churches that existed and uh, john probably knew that you know personally and um, he had some level of uh, uh, you know like apostolic authority over these churches uh, and the lord spoke to him about these seven churches so basically he is evaluating every single church and uh, saying okay these things are good about you but then you know there are these other things which uh, god is really not pleased about so the church of ephesus now he is addressing the church of ephesus over here and he's saying that um, Ephesus is uh, not practicing or, or it's the first love that it had for God. Okay? So uh, it's just become a matter of duty, what the, the church is doing for God. And it's not really out of that initial commitment that the church had. So God doesn't like that. And so uh, the church is being warned and they're told, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent okay so remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent so what god is saying is he's saying that the church will no longer be um uh, something in his presence or remember we began by saying that the tabernacle was but a shadow it was a shadow of the true heavenly worship so the lampstands that we're talking about are in the presence of god so the churches are in the presence of god or you could say in heaven so when god talks about removing the lampstand from before him it means that in his presence right he uh, he is basically going to uh, dismiss that church or he uh, he he's saying that okay you you will know you will not matter anymore this local church will not matter anymore because this local church has not repented so that is the understanding now does this mean that the local church will no longer exist on the earth no the local church may continue to exist and continue to function uh, uh, in in the the uh, patterns of worship that it has developed over the years but ultimately uh, the church belongs to the lord jesus and we are here to please him and if he is not pleased and if he is going to remove the representation of that local church um, uh, off of his presence up in heaven how does it matter even if we are functioning here and we are going about our so-called christian activities okay so that is the understanding there is a warning to every local church and the overseer of every local church and god is saying unless we align ourselves to um, uh, his direction we will stand the chance we we might lose uh, the opportunity to be in his presence okay uh, in a spiritual sense and obviously that impacts the natural church that exists here on the earth so this is really coming as a warning uh, for us uh, where where you know we we must fear uh, being removed from the presence of the lord uh, and that must actually drive us it must drive us to uh, keep you know pursuing the the heart of god and keep checking ourselves assessing ourselves uh, we don't really need to wait for an evaluation the way uh, god has presented uh, for the seven churches of asia minor in the book of revelation but if we are doing a self check if we are doing an evaluation of ourselves from time to time even the pastor you know going before the lord and just being open and letting the lord minister uh, to our hearts uh, what happens is we will be able to pick up you know there are things uh, in us that are displeasing to the lord so we don't run the risk of losing our representation in god's presence or in 
heaven. So the lampstand should continue to be um, uh, uh, before God in his presence. And that's only possible if we continue aligned to uh, the way God wants us to do church. So that is the understanding of the lampstand. Now, the lampstand is also um, a symbol that represents light. And, uh, you know, Jesus introduced himself as I am the light of the world. And then, you know, you, you see other passages where the believers are called as the light. Right? You, you are salt and light. We are the salt and light who need to impact the society or the world around us. So when we look at the lampstand, this is the second understanding which we have. The understanding is about bringing light. Okay? It's about bringing um uh, bringing the light of God. And what does light do? Light dispels the darkness. There is darkness in the world, but you know we are told that uh, we are the ones who bring the hope of the kingdom. We are the ones uh, who um, you know bring all things of the kingdom here on the earth. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So the representatives who will do that uh, is us. Okay, the, the children of God. So the second understanding of uh, the lampstand is that we as believers, you know, we need to be um, that influence uh, or, or, you know, that, that yeast that will work through the batch of dough or you could say uh, the salt that, that will preserve uh, the society, the communities around us. So we are the influence. So light is basically influence, bringing the... the um, the kingdom of God here on the earth. I think we can read a passage here and that will be really helpful. This is uh, Ephesians chapter 8, verse, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, and then um, verses 11 to 13. This is at the end of uh, page number 116. So again, uh, could somebody please read this passage? Ephesians 5, 8, 11 to 8, and then 11 to 13. Andrei. Yes, please. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. It is for this shameful, it is for, it, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in the secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by light. Whatever makes manifest is light. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kennedy. So, you know, we um, see that God calls us as children of light. So we have to walk as children of the light. Uh, in other words, our standards of living must be more righteous. They must be the standards of God. So uh, obviously it will be more righteous than the people in the world. And we are also called you know, not to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But on the other hand, to expose them. Whenever we see uh, something wrong that is that is happening, we as God's people, no, we we are the ones who have to um, uh, call foul and and do our part, right, in overcoming that darkness. So this is the mandate which is given to God's people. We are supposed to shine in this world. And uh, again, you, know, you can go back to so many passages where God promises. First of all, we are light. Okay, we are light, and then uh, we are also promised that the glory of the Lord will will uh, rise upon us. That God's light will shine upon us in this dark world. You no, know, we are here to to receive that light of the kingdom of God, and we have to um, we have to make sure that this light uh, dispels the darkness around us. So that is a very theoretical way of putting it, but. Uh, Whatever else we talked about, you know, earlier we talked about the pillar of truth and how the church is supposed to um, uh, 
uh, have a positive influence in uh, the the situations circumstances uh, uh, around like you know if there is injustice then we have to be that voice of justice if there's corruption then we have to be that voice of uh, righteousness if there is um, what else you know just uh, pull out all the things that that we see around us uh, which are disorderly and we have to set that right standard uh, and we are the ones who have to do something about it have a positive influence that changes you know, the uh, wrong uh, things and activities that are going on around us so uh, this is this is what we are called to do uh, we are called to be the light we are called to be the example in a fallen and in a dark world so that applies to the church why are we discussing about this so uh, the church as a community as a body must be that light uh, in any given community uh, and the individuals as well so it will obviously it will apply to uh, people uh, every individual so i keep um, being reminded of um, uh, a particular ministry uh, which i uh, i heard about and this was in this is in thailand so one of my friends who's also into ministry you know uh, uh, they was it the couple or just the husband yeah one of them went to visit uh, thailand for some ministry work and they were taken around so they were taken to a red light district and uh, in that district apparently in the in the middle of that district there is there is a um, there is a work okay, christian work that is going on uh, which is to to um, rehabilitate you know, women who are caught up in in trafficking and uh, you know women who have lost several years and they have no education they don't know how to take care of their children you know they don't know how uh, to to find a new um, uh, like they don't know how to develop a new skill so basically this ministry is in the middle of the red light district i don't know how they got the permission to to be there but you know they are helping they are helping women they are uh, rehabilitating them they are rescuing them and you know uh, people are able to have a better life so for me whenever i think about the church being the lampstand you know when the light shines in the darkness some of this example comes back to my mind to to think that uh, in a in a place where there is just uh, such incredible darkness you know the works of the evil one and uh, destruction uh, in the lives of people you can have uh, a, a child of god or children of god making a difference okay making a difference and being known for something completely opposite of what is actually going on in that region so just a very uh, a very uh, sort of a, a distinct example which stands out uh, but you know you know what it, what this means it is applicable for every local church in their own context so maybe uh, the the place where we live it, that might not be a red light district but there might be other issues other challenges which uh, which are dark but we as god's people you know, as as uh, led by god's spirit we can be the light that god wants us to be in that community so two things first we said that the lampstand uh, is in the presence of god lampstand represents uh, the church very clearly uh, and god is warning us if we are not aligned uh, to his word his purposes his standards we run the risk of losing our position so that is the first thing about the lampstand so the practical aspect is that you know uh, as a pastor uh, and as a leader as elders of a, a church community you know we must not uh, become very satisfied with our own, with our own evaluation okay because we would have our standards now, what are some of the standards we can have we can have uh, some some standards like okay how big is the church how many people attend how many newcomers uh, come every sunday okay wow you know we are doing better than x y and z so great you know we are doing really well but ultimately it's the evaluation of god so we have to um, uh, go to god and check okay god what do you have to say about our church so that is that is a very conscious thing that uh, each pastor and each leader needs to uh, do because we need we want to know what god thinks about the church because the church belongs to him and the lap stand is before him now what what is the use if uh, we are removed from the presence of god uh, and we continue to exist 
here on earth. You know, that that would be a, a pitiable, very very sorry state of affairs. Uh, that no church, no local pastor uh, would would want to see happen. So. we want to continue being in the presence of god in other words we want to continue uh, pleasing god in everything that we do so uh, we must uh, remember that and coming to the second second uh, uh, understanding of the lamp stand you know we we what we do is we continue to do the good works you know, we continue to remain in god we continue to bless the world around us now what could be some of the challenges now whenever we talk about good works Okay, when we talk about um, uh, aspects that concern, you know, social issues, social justice, uh, you know, what could also happen is that believers can get caught up in doing those works without having any intention of representing Jesus. Okay, I hope I hope you understand what I mean because uh, then. you know we are no different we are no different from the uh, unsaved people or the unbelievers because we there are so many unbelievers out there who are also engaged in good works but the intention of a believer in doing the good works should be to represent christ to uh, bring people into the kingdom of god and uh, uh, to really be you know kingdom focused so our good works are born out of that that intention our good works are based in that intention because we are here to uh, obviously you know if we we are the light um that source of the light is the lord jesus can okay? we are here to shine his light so when we do our good works let the people know this god okay whom we serve so that must be the intention if we miss that and if we are just caught up in okay i did this good work that good work and just you know just uh, engaging in activities then uh, that might not really make a difference for the kingdom of god yeah all right so uh, at this point okay yes uh, samuel uh, please samuel go ahead you have something to add or share uh you're still on mute uh, uh sorry can you hear me ah yes 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 now i can hear you yeah um it's more like a query ma'am um and especially uh i think in terms of uh, a church's power uh in a legal way like uh does uh, a church have some power to interfere or or even object uh, in the affairs of the state like like for example let's say there's a church and uh, it's based somewhere near a slum and let's say the government decides to get rid of the slum and build i'm i'm giving a hypothetical situation like they want to construct uh, say like a housing colony and the slum a lot of some people come to the church um, and they like and they, supposing you know, they say like this they they've been promised that they reallocated but it's not very clear and all of that so does like can a church do something you know like like apart from just talking to the authorities does a church have uh, some legal power vested where it can put a objection or something like that uh, if if you knew of any such cases thank you mm-hmm. yes yes thank you thank you sir uh so see uh, in our country uh, for that matter i don't think we have any special um privileges or special opportunities um you know from like if you look at these legal legal activities we are like any other citizen of the country uh now talking about the influence uh, which we can have you see uh, as individuals we are citizens and we can use the uh, the rights or the powers w- which have already been given to us so if we want to object the same hypothetical situation if we want to object to uh, you know that the the removal of that slum uh, i think we can have a voice now how do you make that voice stronger uh that also can be done in mm, lawful ways so we we may want to connect up with uh, some lawyers okay who who have the know how to to help uh, that slum uh, and you know 
like other influencers basically other influencers now these influencers could be uh, from our community when i say that i mean the believing community so maybe some believers or they could be uh, like minded people from other faiths even okay because this is a matter of uh, social you know some social cause so we can we can actually link up uh, with or believers or people from other faiths who are working on the same cause uh, and make a voice stronger so there is no such special privilege uh, samuel at least in the indian context mm -hmm. but like the voice, uh, yeah. yeah yeah i mean the church can't go up to the government saying like we we, we come from this church and we represent and we want to object mm. not really yeah i mean they'll be mm. like how why would they why would they give us a special uh, right. you know hearing why right um, now just uh, yeah i i would just wanted to know you know if the church had like like if one such church is like if, like for example uh, i know that um, a marriage certificate issued by a church hmm. has uh, can be produced as a legal document Huh. In, in, so, so in in that context, I was thinking like apart from like few of these things, like were there any other, like especially when it came to uh, you know impacting the society in some way, like mm. did church have any legal power vested? Like were religious organizations, mm -hmm. uh, not just church, uh, have any vested uh, power in them mm. by the government? Yes. So I think depending on the cause, uh, we'll have to check. right okay if we are a, if we are a registered uh, religious body then the mm. government gives us certain rights privileges and also there'll be responsibilities so right. we'll have to study that and then see whether we we have some influence okay okay all right yeah sure, sure. thank you thank you yeah. thank you i mean if if you do come across any references uh, pastor way mm. which which has some uh, insights on what Uh, like religious bodies, maybe not necessarily church, but religious bodies, organization in India. Uh, what are the yeah. special powers given by the government? That might be helpful also to mm. know the rights of a church in a legal way. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, Thank sure, you. Uh, Samuel. I, if I come across, I'll say, share those links with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You. Right. So. Uh, hmm. so just uh, i had a train of thought but i think i lost it oh yes um so based on samuel's question i was reminded of uh, uh, paul okay paul uh, on his uh, second missionary journey when he's in the city of philippi mm, they catch him they put him in the prison uh, and uh, uh, you know wonderful things happen spiritually they're singing hymns to the lord and the prison is opened up they are set free but they don't run away that gives them an opportunity to minister to the jailer the jailer and his family they come to know uh, christ and then you know when all of this is done the uh, magistrates or the the leadership of that city they say okay put them away like uh, ask them to leave at that point you know paul being a roman citizen he uses his privilege he says no how dare you uh, just put us in and then leave uh, let us go without a fair trial like what is the procedure here what is the process here so he puts his foot down to to um, uh, kind of uh, threaten the local authorities and they get scared they till that point they don't realize that he's a roman citizen but when they realize he's a roman citizen and certain rights uh, are given to the roman citizen they really get scared they're like oh, oh okay there are some there are some you know uh, uh, privileges that this man has uh, we, we are sorry we really didn't know you're a roman citizen otherwise we would not have done this to you so you know i'm just reminded of how in a way he was very well aware uh, of of his uh, privileges he understood the law of the land and in whatever he did he he tried his best never to override or never to disrespect or dishonor the law never to disrespect another faith like you see him going and preaching in athens okay and in athens they have all kinds of philosophies all kinds of beliefs he he doesn't put them down he presents uh, his view uh, in a, in a very honorable and a respectful way 
okay so nobody is able to point a finger or catch him and say look at this guy you know he has he has done this it's wrong uh, they had yes he is caught later on and he's tried and all of that but that's with uh, their own allegations you know which are baseless I and mean, then they they keep him in rope for a long time because they're not able to get a handle uh, on you know how to how to get this guy how to uh, how to actually uh, you know get rid of this guy so uh, the point i'm making is see we we need to be aware of the law of the land we need to be aware of our privilege uh, privileges as citizens of you know uh, countries so when when we are well aware we can have a voice and how to strengthen that voice you know i just gave some ideas over there if we are a positive influence in a community the people around us will understand i i mean i'm just saying let's say that church in the slum area they have done good work over the last 10 years uh, and they try to do something for the people and uh, the the authorities say oh no we are not going to listen to this church the community will stand up for you people influential people around that space maybe some other uh, you know mlas some other uh, uh, big shots with with you know a lot of money and influence they will speak up for us and they'll say we know these people they have done good service you know we are with them we are backing them up so uh, yes you know uh, we must listen to this church so god works in all of these ways also so uh, yeah it's like uh, being heavenly minded but being earthly wise so we can be aware of the environment uh, the law of the land and all you, you can work very uh, legally in a right way uh, in every given situation so just want to add that uh, yes uh, kennedy uh, you seem to have a question or a comment please go ahead yes yes uh i think brother samuel has raised a very pertinent issue mm. because like in our in our locality there's a there's a new trend where there's so many churches that are mushrooming up mm. as in next door there's a church next door there's a church then there's the issue of noise pollution you know it's it's it has been legislated so what's your take on this because you, you, you tend to find like the time of praise and worship it becomes very noisy it goes beyond the acceptable levels of noise then it's within the slums then it's also causing a health issue so what's your take on that yeah so uh, i mean the answer is in the question kennedy when it's ca- causing noise you call it noise pollution so first of all it's noise so i think uh, the church must be sensitive to the people around and uh, if it is uh, you know inconveniencing the neighbors uh, then change the timing or change the uh, uh, like remove the loud speakers or maybe do some sound proofing something right something to make sure that what we do is not inconveniencing you know another person or another a uh, community around us and uh, here uh, we have some rules at least uh, i know bangalore and where i live there are certain rules like you know after 10 pm you must not have uh, you must not have loud speakers you must not have you know uh, even if it is religious events then you shouldn't be noisy and all that so just go by the the rules of that given place so yeah kennedy i think uh, the church can do many things to bring down the noise Okay, are you on mute, Kennedy? Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So uh, that's again interesting. So whenever we have this, um, like our outreach churches, no, uh, when they have to find a new place to put up their church, then this is one of the things you know we look for. We discuss about all these things. Okay, what is the neighborhood like? Uh, will it be too noisy? Will we disturb them? so these are all things we have to think about yeah so yeah a good question say anything else to add or um, uh 
Okay. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, what we've discussed today is quite straightforward. We're just saying that uh, God must recognize our work and be pleased with it. And as believers, uh, we must have uh, godly standards, which are obviously higher than the world standards. And wherever there's darkness, so there is uh, something that the church is able to do to shine the light of Christ. Uh, so here in our notes, chapter 18 is more of a summary um, of whatever we have touched on so far. We've looked at 10 pictures, 10 pictures of the church as given in the Bible. We said that the church is the body of Christ, okay, where uh, we, we are his hands, we are his feet, we are here to do the works of God. We said that the church is the family of God, where uh, you know we are all knit together. We are here to care for one another. We are here to support one another and stand together. Uh, we said that the church is the pillar of truth. So uh, we stand our ground um, even against you know, uh, ungodly traditions, uh, opposing philosophies, false religions. You know, we continue to stand our ground, speak the truth of God's word uh, in, in every situation. Then we said that we are the army of God. So we are here together with a mission. We are here uh, fighting a spiritual battle. We are here overthrowing the works of darkness and overcoming uh, any any form of demonic interference. We also said that the church is the bride of Christ. So we said that we share this very special relationship with Christ. We share a deep love uh, with our God and um, that you know we have to uh, live our lives consecrated unto the Lord and uh, uh, you know adoring Him and being very expectant of His return. So that is the picture of the bride of Christ. We also said that the church is the house of prayer and worship, and it's so important for us to be given uh, to these things. And we talked about uh, God's promise of rebuilding the tabernacle of David. So that is something that we will see happen uh, in all the churches, that spirit uh, of intercession being poured out on us, that desire to uh, give ourselves more to worshiping the Lord. So uh, the church needs this to be a house of prayer and worship. We are also the temple of God. So by that, we said that God's presence dwells in us, and that's what makes us... Uh, because without God's presence, a temple is not a temple. So God's presence is essential. And we said that wherever God is, he manifests his glory. So the works of God, the power of God being revealed through us, uh, you know, that must be the norm. So we are the temple of God. We also said that we are God's people. In other words, Zion. You know, we talked about us being God's people and how we are special. We are chosen and we are called to uh, declare his praises among the people. So we are different. Okay? We, are, we should be radically different. Uh, and we are um, chosen in that sense. Then we also looked at the fact that we are the branches of the wine. So the importance of being connected to God, the importance of having the life of God flow through us, the importance of um, living a fruitful life. Okay, uh, So all of these things we, we understood when we studied about the church being uh, the branches on the true vine. And today we've seen that uh, we are a lampstand set by God, uh, before God, and we must maintain our position we must uh, let God assess our life and our devotion and always realign ourselves if there's something wrong, repent of it. And at the same time, we are called to be the light that shines in the midst of darkness. So uh, depending on the grace which is given to each and every church, I know that every church uh, may not uh, you know, engage in the same social action, but depending on how the Lord calls each of us and what the needs are around us, we can respond, we can respond and we can be that light that represents Christ. So these are the 10 aspects. Now again, we must uh, realize that we may not be engaging in a certain um, 
certain aspect of what we have talked about uh, a lot right uh, compared to the others for example we might a, a, a certain church they might be really strong in praise and worship and prayer and intercession but as far as being a lampstand is concerned uh, as far as uh, you know maybe uh, addressing a certain issues concern maybe they don't do too much of it they do uh, as and when the lord leads them to to engage in certain matters they engage but their strength or the grace upon them lies more in the uh, aspect of a house of prayer and worship or the bride of christ so we must understand every local church um in or let's put it this way the way god has called each local church the, remember we talked about the vision of the local church the mission of the local church so there is a greater grace in a, a given area but this doesn't mean that we can oversee we, we can uh, even let go of uh, other areas we every local church must touch on all the 10 aspects okay all the 10 aspects and not miss out on these 10 aspects but the way it happens right to what degree all that will be uh, only directed by the spirit of god so we really need to rely on god uh, we really need to rely depend on god and his leading so again uh, that that is one one thing so we are not called in a certain way we have to understand that the second thing is that there are seasons so any given church will go through its journey and uh, let's say in one season okay, in one season uh, there's a lot of um, okay let me look at these aspects okay in one season um, we are we are serving as uh, th there's more of the family of god thing happening where people are coming in we are doing more in the area of member care we are doing more in the area of life groups connecting with people you know establishing relationships and all that but as the church moves on and so some of those things are in place our focus might move to something slightly different right so uh, maybe we we are um, engaging more in being the pillar of truth in a, another season it might be a season where uh, a lot of wrong teachings have come in our in our region so stuff like that so it depends also on the season that the church is in uh, so it's not about you know force fitting uh, these aspects onto a local church and it will not work that way so we must really recognize god's grace bestowed on us we must really recognize the season that we are in uh, we must recognize the journey that the believers are making or if it's a new church new believers then we take them through that journey we don't try to force them uh, into um, uh, revealing one of the aspects that we have discussed so far so uh, i think with this i will uh, stop the session uh, was there anyone who raised your hand because i heard a prompt but i don't see any raised hand here all right uh, so let's let's pause here uh, we'll go for a break we'll come back and we will move on to the next section here about uh, divine order in the local church and yeah this will also be interesting Okay so let's go for a break class and we'll be back in 10 minutes thank you